Hello all and welcome. My name is Margaret. I'm a historical costumer and textile conservator in training. And today I have a very exciting video. This is a topic that I think about a lot. And if I'm ever to do a PhD, it will be on this subject. I've been working on this for a while, so apologies for the lateness of this video, but hopefully it will be a very interesting one to you. So the topic of today's video is the reuse and recycling of 18th century dresses throughout history. For this video, we are going to take it all the way from the 18th century to the 1970s, where we will end at your grandmother's floral couch, because there is a through line here. Granted, some of this is conjecture and needs more research, needs like primary source PhD level research, but there is a through line and we will get there. Starting with their manufacturer, moving into sort of their primary use area alterations where they were altered for a changing body, changing size, and changing styles into their early 19th century alterations, which are debatable whether those are quote unquote primary use or secondary use. We will get into those terms in just a bit, followed by fancy dress of the late 19th century and their use in historic homes in the early 20th. So I am really interested and I've done a lot of research in how antique clothing was altered, both in its primary use state, when it was used as actual clothing for the body, when it was altered to fit another wearer or potentially be a slightly different style, reusing in the context that we think of it normally, but also after its use life in these secondary use scenarios where it is being re remade into, say, upholstery or into a fancy dress costume, an alteration not in its original context. I did make a video about this in the context of buying antiques and what is quote original and what is sort of altered state. <laughs> you can of course watch that video up here or down below. I will link it in the description and in the cards if you're interested in me talking more about sort of the use and reuse alterations of antique garments. Today we're going to focus in on one type of antique garment and that is the sack back gown, sometimes also called a robe à la française. However, we will not just be talking about robe à la française in this video. Sack back gowns are essentially gowns that have a va toe or sack back pleat in the back. Essentially it's just lengths of fabric that has been intricately pleated with these large, large box pleats on the back of the gown that extends to the shoulders almost all the way to the floor. And these were popular throughout the majority of the 18th century. So with the sack back gowns, we start out with the original sack, also called the robe volante, baton, innocent. I believe that's how you say it in French. I'm sure some of you will correct me if it's not. These were popular from the short time period of about 1715 until 1730, followed by their successor, the robe à la française, also the sac or sac, whichever you want to use the English or French spelling. These gowns were popular from about uh, the 1730s until the 1780s. The style slowly changes throughout from the open front stomachered gowns of the 1740s, 50s, and 60s to the closed front styles of the 1770s and 1780s. I have a video about me making a closed front style robe à la française. Again, I will pop it up, down, up here and pop it down below the playlist of me making that gown. But the really important thing to note about these sack gowns is the fabric from which they were made. Although sack gowns were made out of many different types of fabric, I'm sure, many of them and many of the surviving ones that we have are made of silk brocade. 18th century silk brocade is the height of pre-industrial weaving in the Eurocentric world. This fabric was very, very expensive for the time period because it is incredibly labor intensive and silk obviously being a more expensive fiber, both in the period we are in now and back then as well. It retains its value because it is hand woven. And there are just some things you can't do on a machine. And with silk brocade, especially with the intricately patterned ones, hand weaving, you can actually weave the ends in. You can spot weave those extra warps or wefts to get really precise, very neat shapes and beautiful intricate colors. Whereas with a machine woven brocade, 
the Jacquard loom was the first sort of brocading machine that we have that comes up in 1808, you have to have those supplemental wefts all the way through. So you either have long floats on the back or you have sort of blocks of color. And that means you can't get some of the intricate patterns and wild things that they did with 18th century silk. One of my favorite 18th century silks has like cheetah print on it, which is, which is wild to think that they were doing that in the 18th century. But essentially this fabric was expensive then and it retains its value throughout history, which is why it is reused and reused and reused and reused and upcycled because it is just so beautiful and so unique and so elegantly done. So let's get into the story of sack gowns and their eventual end, becoming your grandmother's floral couch. So first we're gonna talk about those primary use alterations in sack gowns. We touched on the robe of the Lant. This gown, again, popular for only a very short period of time, but very popular, especially in France, where there was a Regency going on at the period and dress codes were a little bit more relaxed, especially sort of in court. This gown is essentially just lengths of fabric that have been pleated and loosely shaped into like the world's most fashionable muumu. And there are not many that survive. There are a handful out there in the world still. There's maybe six or seven that we know of. I've seen different numbers here and there, and a few have been found quite recently. But the reason for this is because when you have a gown that is essentially uninterrupted lengths of fabric with a few pleat lines and a few little bits of shaping, but mostly uninterrupted yardage, gown and matching petticoat, by the way, we're talking potentially up to 20 yards. Remember, 18th century silks are much, much narrower than yardage we have today. We're talking anywhere from about 19 to 29 inches wide. And 29 inches is like Chinese silks, which are much bigger than um, European silks normally. But you have this uninterrupted length that literally have a couple of crease pleat creases and like maybe some stitch lines through it, really, really easy to upcycle, right? Really easy. So my theory, and this is a really hard theory to prove, but my theory is that the robe volante was very, very easy to transform into a robe a la francaise. You literally keep the back, you, you cut the front, you cut the front of the skirt, right? Kind of open it up a little bit, get rid of that length, maybe use it for robings, you know, little self-robing situation, you already have the petty. You might, you know, tailor it a bit here and there, but it's so easy to change into a Robe à la There are very, very few Robe à la Francaises left in the world that are not altered at least once to update the style or to update it for a different wearer. So it's very hard to tell what alterations are from what, especially when you have a gown that's been altered three, four times in its primary use life. It's also hard to tell because we're using the same techniques in this period. And so honestly, that's probably where all the robe volants went. During this period, of course, robe volants and robe la francaises were often passed down because this is a period pre-industrial, we're hand sewing everything, we're hand weaving everything. Fabric is very, very expensive. Clothing is very, very expensive. So your clothing upon your death or even, you know, when you're cleaning out your closet would be bequeathed to your children or your relatives or even your servants as part of their payment. Of course, only very, very wealthy people are able to afford silk brocade, but because it's so expensive, it would be reused and it would be reused and reused and reused. It would be made into household textiles. It was made into men's dressing gowns. It was made into children's clothes, but the volant style, very easy to transition into the Francais style. The Francais style, very easy to transition into the clothes back styles of the later century. I will have so many examples to show you of Francaises that were updated for the later 18th century. But then, you know, it goes on from there into household textiles and ch children's clothes as well. And this is, of course, due to that shaping in the Francais as well, the sack back, super easy to update. So often when they are transformed into clothes back styles, they sort of stay there in that clothes back style state. Because those are a lot harder to alter for a different wearer. Those are a lot harder to alter into a different style. However, when we hit the middle of the 1890s, the French Revolution, all of this sort of cultural shift, 
fashion changes and silk brocade falls out of style for a little bit. And so you sort of see a pause in the use of these silk brocades in fashionable items for about 30 to 40 years. And that takes us to the early 19th century. I'm going to lump these early 19th century alterations into a new category of alterations, which I have termed semi-contemporaneous or second primary use life. We're working, we're workshopping this. We're workshopping this. We are. Essentially, in the early to mid 19th century, the first gown I found is 1820. The latest gown I found is in the mid 1860s. Robe de France or other 18th century dresses were upcycled into fashionable evening gowns of the period. So essentially, again, you got that sack back very easily. You've got inter uninterrupted yardage, especially when you're making a new gown. Super, super easy to zip that apart and make it into a new style. Although this was popular, again, I said earliest 1820 I've seen and latest the uh, mid 1860s. This was most popular, I would say, in the 1840s and the early 1850s. The dress I want to talk about specifically for this period of Francais alterations is one from MFIT, the Museum of the Fashion Institute of Technology. I've seen this dress several times, once on exhibition. Images you'll see on the screen is from the exhibition Roses, which was in the fall of 2019. I believe there's a catalog for that exhibition if you are interested in knowing more. But essentially, this gown is from the 1840s and is upcycled from a probably 1770s, 1760s, 1770s silk. You can see the pleating in the bodice. You can see the Francaise pleating in the bodice, and you, you can see thread scarring, needle scarring, throughout some of the bodice pieces. If you are upcycling a Francaise, even though you do have that long uninterrupted yardage, there are very telltale signs. And those are the vertical creases for the Vato pleats, and thread scarring along where the hem would have been and where the waist would have been. There's also often some pleat marks for the front waist section and sometimes you can also see uh, where the tops of those pleats were as well. This will become important later on. You, they also use the sort of fringe, fly fringe of the gown to create trim on, on the new evening gown as well. So this is a very good example of how these dresses were transformed. And there are many, many, many extant 1840s, 1850s, again, a couple decades on either side, gowns that have been upcycled from 18th century dresses. Now we move out of the contemporaneous, semi-contemporaneous alterations. Now we're moving into the late 19th century, where both very good things and not so good things are happening to these dresses. The first thing that I want to note that is happening in the late 19th century is the start of many fashion collections, both in the US and the UK. So fashion collections in the US, the earliest I've seen is the 1890s, 1894 with the um, Fox Historic Clothing Collection at Drexel University. Uh, a lot of the large museum collections kind of start in the 1920s, 1930s in the US, and then kind of move in the 1970s is when a lot of the university collections are sort of codified into museum collections. But essentially, this is the very early part of dress collecting in the United States. In the UK, they're a little bit earlier in their dress collecting. 1890s is also when they sort of start. The VNA starts, I believe, in 1894. But these wonderful 18th century gowns are starting to enter museum collections. Another thing is happening with them as well, and that is 19th century fancy dress. 19th century and the early 20th century, it was very chic to throw a costume ball. Many happened in England and the UK. I don't actually know a ton about costume fancy dress balls in Europe. I'm sure they happened, but I don't have any sources for them in this video. And for these balls, if you were a fancy person, and you wanted to go as an 18th century lady, you probably had a robot de Francaise or Anglaise in your attic that you could upcycle for this ball. And this happened a lot. 
there is an example from the McCord Museum, which you'll be seeing on the screen now, which was worn to a ball in 1898. And it really showcases how these gowns could be transformed for 19th century taste. Not every gown was wildly transformed like the one at the McCord Museum. That one's shape is like completely different. Some were very lightly altered, just new boning was put in, just very lightly altered. Um, there's a, so many at the VNA that were lightly altered and can still be exhibited. I would say, and this is my own conservative estimate, that about 60% of 18th century dresses in museum collections were altered for 19th century fancy dress. Oftentimes, this is not information that is advertised by the museum, and they are sort of put up as completely original. Sometimes that's completely fine because the alterations are so minimal, it doesn't really stand out. Sometimes you can look at them and be like, that was monkeyed with, like, definitely monkeyed with, but it's still not necessarily in the catalog. So just note that this happened to a lot of dresses, not necessarily as dramatic as the one from the McCord Museum, and they're like, this has definitely been altered. <laughs> Like, we have the photo of the lady wearing it, like, we know. But there is an interesting line of how museums play with authenticity when it comes to 19th century fancy alterations in 18th century dress. It's a very interesting fine line that we walk. Now, this also kind of typifies how historic dress was seen in this period. Obviously, the fashion collections are starting, but it's still not a subject, a collecting area that people are actively interested in preserving, especially in the context of these fancy dress alterations. I will say this does still happen. I have seen the le kind of newest 18th century dress alteration for costume wear that I've seen was probably done in the early 2000s. And this wasn't a particularly egregious one, but it was, it, de it definitely happened in the early 2000s. So this still goes on and this kind of keeps going on. I don't recommend doing that. 18th century, you know, these dresses are at this point very rare and are an important part of our collective cultural history. And I do think that these are sort of museum worthy things. And we can talk about the alteration and the wear of historic dress in another video. It's something that I've definitely been thinking about doing for a while, but this does still happen. This keeps happening. This has happened for a while, but there was a big boon of it in the late 19th century just just is how it is. And now we get to the colonial revival. Yay. So the colonial revival is something that is very distinctly American. So think of this distinctly American context. And this is where we get to floral couches, don't worry. So the colonial revival is a period in American decorative arts from approximately the 1880s until the 1950s. Although I think it goes a little past that with certain populations EI, your grandmother. Um, so we sort of, I'm sort of extending it into the 60s and 70s for this video as well. But essentially it is a period of American decorative arts that is looking at the past styles of colonial America, I think around the revolution, so like 1740s to 1790s, I would say, trying to create that design style in a very authentic way but also very much through the lens of early 20th century, late 19th century American taste. So there are a few projects that really, really typify this period. One is Colonial Williamsburg. Colonial Williamsburg was started as a project, as a rebuilding of the colonial capital of Virginia. Started in 1924, it opened in 1932. What started out as sort of the conservation of a couple buildings then became a massive recreation with new buildings, new colonial buildings of the capital of Virginia, Williamsburg. I bring up Colonial Williamsburg specifically to show you the scale of things that were happening at this time. But the one place that I really want to focus in on is Winneter. Now, I should say, I go to Winneter for school, so I am very familiar with the Winneter story and have worked on several projects that I hope to share with you at some point surrounding this topic at Winneter. And I really, I, I, I speak to this specifically because I know a lot about it, but this did happen other places as well. It's not just a HF DuPont thing. So to give you some background on Winneter, Winneter is the estate 
of H.F. DuPont, Henry Francis DuPont, outside of Wilmington, Delaware. He inherited it from a long line of DuPonts, and he essentially took what was a very, quite, I mean, small, smaller country house and expanded it into his own museum. He was a big collector of American, early American antiques. And he not only collected furniture and textiles and ceramics and all that, he collected fragments of buildings. He created his home, he built on extra rooms in his home, in 1929 by the way, best year to start a large home renovation. He built on these extra rooms of his home, like a hundred extra rooms on his home, so that he could essentially play one-to-one -one dollhouse with his American antiques and set up these very intricate period rooms that were supposed to be accurate, but very much so to H.F. DuPont's taste. Now one thing that H.F. DuPont did, and is not exclusive to him, it's not exclusive to him, just so you know, is that he wanted his antiques, his rooms, to be furnished with period textiles. He bought a lot of textiles. Textiles from Europe were being bought um, very vigorously throughout the early 19th century, and by the 40s, the 50s, there wasn't a lot left. So he would buy antique 18th century dresses and he would use them to upholster his furniture. This happened quite a bit in the Winneter estate, but this, again, not exclusive to him. There is an upholsterer by the name of Ernest Lanano. There are actually three upholsterers by the name of Ernest Lanano. It's very hard to distinguish <laughs> which one is which sometimes when you're doing research, but the second Ernest Lanano did a lot of upholstery with these 18th century dresses for DuPont. And again, if you were looking at a piece of furniture that was upholstered during the colonial revival, and you see the pleat lines, and you see the thread scars, you can probably point it out as something that has upholst been upholstered with an X dress. I call them dead dresses. Ghost dresses? No longer dresses. Dresses. I will be putting a few examples on the screen of objects at Windsor that were upholstered with these dresses. I find it kind of sad, but again, there is a lot of history of reusing these textiles and it was done a long time ago, so it is what it is. Now, during this period as well, a company called Scalamandre begins, and their thing was these high quality silk fabrics for mostly upholstery, although I have seen them be used for many, many beautiful reconstruction projects, and Scalamandre specifically looked at what was being done with these dresses, specifically dresses, and they recreated those patterns to be used for upholstery. Now, 18th century dress fabric and 18th century upholstery fabric are two different things, okay? You wouldn't have upholstered a settee in the 18th century with the same fabric you would have made a dress out of. But during this colonial revival period, these two things get very intertwined. And what is what in the 18th century would have been distinctly upholstery and dress fabric become one and the same. But they're creating recreations of dead dresses. So you have this colonial revival taste is now being manufactured by Scalamandre, giving people the chance to participate in this colonial revival movement that aren't necessarily like the H.F. DuPont collectors. I feel like the height of this is 1962, when Jackie Kennedy gives a tour of the newly revamped, renovated White House. Um, so Jackie Kennedy decided to restore the White House to its colonial decorativeness. This house will always grow and should. It just seemed to me such a shame when we came here to find hardly anything of the past in the house. And she definitely did it in a very Jackie Kennedy 1960s type of way, but she did go to Winneter and she did have H.F. DuPont on this council of people that she had for this renovation restoration project. So it's very much linked to the colonial revival. Again, a little bit out of the time period, but very much linked to the colonial revival. 
she had Scalamandre do most of the textiles. Again, they definitely have their floral dress impersonation couch fabric going on. Do you do all of the uh, reupholstering of these old pieces in here? We do mostly. It's much quicker and more practical. It's so exciting to see things grow every day. And it was televised on TV. And in 1962, there were not many things that were televised on TV. It was a big deal. And it definitely, for people who look at tastemakers like Jackie Kennedy, was a big deal. And the colonial revival style sort of has this second wave-ish, kind of, in the 1960s and 70s. The same people who would probably have farmhouse decor right now would probably have done a Jackie Kennedy White House, because this is, like, high class, and these floral couches of this high class, colonial revival style, sort of go through the filter of the groovies, 60s and 70s, western movie, you know, flower power kind of situation, and come out the other side as 70s floral couches. Is it tenuous? Maybe. But I like to think that it is directly related to the colonial revival, which is directly using 18th century dress textiles, which comes from a long line of beautiful weaving and alterations to come to the point where this turns into this. So 18th century fabric that was never meant to be upholstery ends up in your grandmother's basement after being interpreted by several different lenses throughout history. It's a wild story, and I am so happy you came along with me to tell it to you. I will definitely be doing more videos on the alterations of garments, definitely be doing more videos on how we have treasured these antiques, how they're being worn and sold in slightly dubious ways. We can talk about that. I also have some exciting conservation treatment videos coming up, as well as some other sort of commentary-esque videos and sewing and all that stuff that we do on this channel. And I try to put out a video every two weeks. We'll see how that goes in the coming months because guess what? I'm almost done with grad school. It's gonna be a fun, fun time. We can talk about that too. So if you would like to come along with me on these adventures, you can of course hit the subscribe button down below. You can follow me over on TikTok and Instagram, both at Costuming Conservation, and you can just have a lovely day. I'll see you later.